So in terms of mathematical models, uh, these are the things I wanted to chat about today. It's some kind of big picture overview, uh, a very quick example to kind of illustrate the process. Do a quick do a quick um, example that really shows how it works because it's actually even though it's maybe shrouded in some kind of mystique, it's really a very simple process. And so that's kind of what I'd like to cover today. And the next time we'll talk about how we'd apply this to Smithville. Actually, we might start on that today, but we'll see. Okay, so um, in terms of uh, overview. So what you'll recall is that we're attempting to represent a couple of different equations. One we haven't said very much about. which is the groundwater flow equation, which you should all remember um, from 452. And so 8K is hydraulic conductivity, H is head, it uses Darcy's law, which allows us to write that the velocity of flow is equal to hydraulic conductivity times the head gradient, which we know. It's a negative in there, I guess, for some reasons. And I guess this would be the flow in the x direction. These could be different hydraulic conductivities in x and y if we wanted them. Um, if it was anisotropic, which often, sometimes it is. This is specific storage, and this is time. So this is the time-dependent uh, flow equation. And so, we use that to get some picture of what the, uh, the head distribution would be in our uh, aquifer. And if we know what the head distribution is, we can use that to calculate what the velocity distribution is as well. And we need to do that because when we look at uh, transport, so this is flow, if you remember. If we look at transport, then the transport equation looks something like... Um, a retardation coefficient, a change in concentration with time, and that's equal to some mechanical disperse, longitudinal dispersion times a change in concentration plus a change in transverse dispersion with a change in concentration. Uh, and a advective flow velocity times a different change in concentration. Right? So this is uh, dispersion. This is advection. This is uh, capacitance or yeah, mass storage, if you like. Both of these terms are storage. This is storage of fluid, the liquid, and this is storage of dissolved mass, if you like, but both of them are those same terms. Um, and we know how we've used those. We've at least used the second one, and we understand exactly what these different terms mean uh, based on you know, this plug flow behavior when these terms are zero, and this is finite, and with dispersion when you get this spreading around the front, <laughs> and for non-conservative flow, when R is greater than 1, right? Non-conservative. So that's kind of uh, stuff that we've looked at before. So this is kind of laid out in here, only to make the point uh, that these equations are very similar to each other. They all look, they all have a term which depends on a rate of change in time, this capacitance term on the left-hand side. They have a term which is the second-order derivative. Right? This here and this here, both of these. And, that, and one of them at least has a term which is a first-order term. So first-order in x, second-order in x, first-order in time. And so in addition to that, all that changes is the magnitudes of the coefficients that you might want to apply to this. By choosing these different coefficients, you can get it to represent these expressions. So if, in other words, if you take this expression and you put in the dependent variable of head for this, you put in the value of R here is specific storage, the value of D here is hydraulic conductivity, 
and the velocity is zero, then you get the float equation. If you look for um, non-conservative transport, then you can make the substitutions for mass concentration, the retardation coefficient for r, the dispersion magnitude for this term here, and the advective velocity for this term, and you've got a different equation. And so, and you can look at it for gas diffusion. We didn't really talk about vapor transport in great detail, but you can imagine that you can use this basic format to look at a whole bunch of different physical processes, and these are just standard expressions that are used to represent those. And so what you could imagine, that you could have one kind of generic software package that would allow you to solve lots of different physical problems. And that's really how most of these software packages work, is that they solve this generic expression <coughs> here. And uh, depending on the coefficients that you put in to solve it and the dependent variables, it gives you a result. And so you can get a solution that will solve for flow. And also the same solver will solve for transport. And it will also solve for gas diffusion as well. And gas diffusion with or without advective transport, just by changing these variables. So that's fine. So that's how these, these systems work. Um, so, but how do we kind of simplify that a little bit? Well, let's talk at much more uh, basic terms as to what we're trying to do. So we'll, we'll come back to this later. But we'll talk about using one method is to take these differential equations and state them instead of being as partial derivatives, we state them as being finite derivatives. So instead of writing things like dh dx, we can write that as the change in head over some length. And so we, we make it a finite derivative. And so finite differences is one way that you can solve these equations. You should have seen it. Certainly, you must have seen it in your, your background already. Um, and so let's first of all take the, the idea of the, the flow equation that we want to solve. And so I guess I can do it in the sheet of paper as much as anything. So the flow equation is what? The flow equation we already wrote. My, is my writing getting better? It looks to me like it's getting much better. Don't I think? <laughs> or it could be just delusional, of course. So specific storage. Change in head with time is equal to hydraulic conductivity. Change in head with space plus hydraulic conductivity change in head with space in the y direction. So let's assume that it's a steady state problem, so it doesn't change with time, so we get rid of that. Let's assume that we only have a one-dimensional problem, so we're, we're solving our proverbial flow maybe along our tube uh, in at one end. We've looked at this many times. Maybe if we plot, for instance, in the x direction, and we plot the head from upstream to downstream, then we have something that looks like whatever the head is that we put here. How's I going to do this? Maybe with three different things. Yeah. So let's take, divide this into two intermediate locations and an end location. And we have a head here. And how I'm going to number this doesn't matter. And a head here. And if we thought that, for instance, the hydraulic conductivity um, was constant along here, equals one meter a second. That would be a big hydraulic conductivity, but just let's put it equal to that. Let's assume that we put some kind of head here equal to h upstream, put some lower head here up equal to h downstream, and those are the values h u and h d, um, what would we expect the head distribution to look like along here? You can rationalize exactly what that would be. Would it be linear? Would it be, would it be this? Would it be this? Or would it be this? Yeah, linear. Yeah, constant gradient, linear change in head. And you know that because we've already said, well, you know that Darcy's law says that the velocity is equal to minus hydraulic, K, 
hydro minus hydraulic gradient times gradient. If the velocity here is not going to accumulate just like traffic along a street, uh, if traffic along streets going in the same direction, nothing accumulates. If one car is going faster than the car in front, then you get bunching up, and so you're accumulating a mass of cars at a particular location. And so if we want to avoid that, then the velocity everywhere has to be the same. If the velocity is everywhere the same, then the gradient has to be the same at every single point. And the only line that represents a constant magnitude of gradient that is non-zero, that, that allows you to meet these two boundary conditions of the head upstream and the head downstream, is, is this. So, so you know that. Okay. So what we're going to do is we'd like to be able to divide this up into maybe um, a system where we perhaps divide it up into, according to these three locations, into three particular blocks. And what we can do is we can write solve for the magnitudes of the heads at each of these locations as a function of the boundary conditions. And so to do that, what we could do is we could take this block here, for instance. That's not very good, is it? That was a, a bracket. So we could take this. Ooh, that's much better. You could take this block here to represent behavior. And we could write it out in some way that, say, if we looked at a two-dimensional case, then we'd write it like this. And so we're only going to use this one and this one and this one, kind of going along the length of here. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this length here and we're going to put it as a finite difference star to represent these three nodes, if you like, in these blocks. And I'm going to just number them counterclockwise. So this we'll call H0, we'll call this H1, head 2, head 3, and head 4. We're not going to worry about this. We're going to define this as the x direction. We're going to define this as the y direction. And we're going to define this length here as delta x and delta x. And so what we're going to do is we're going to ignore the fact that it changes in y. So we will get rid of this term here. And so the equation we're solving is just 0 is equal to hydraulic conductivity d2h dx squared. If it equals 0, then it doesn't matter that this is any, it could be any number. It doesn't really matter. But we could also write this as hydraulic conductivity times a rate of change. And actually, this is shorthand for this written out like this. You might remember, right? These two are the same equations. And so what we could do is we could write this as equal to a change of this property in the x direction of delta h over delta x. And so what we could do is we could figure out exactly what the, the change is as you go from this location to the other. So how are we going to do this? Maybe it's easiest now to kind of draw this in terms of... So I'm going to draw this thing here. in terms of head versus location. And so you can imagine that if these are the, the points I'm drawing, I'm going to make this value here h0. I'm going to make this value arbitrarily h3. I'm not going to do them as the same. I'm going to let them change. So this value here would be h1. So this this ordinate here would be h1, if you like. And this is delta x and delta x. And so if you wanted to calculate what this derivative is, this is delta x. This is, um, this is going to be um, h1 minus h0. And the reason we do that is that we're going to write it at this point. So this length, if you like, delta x is equal to x1 minus x0. So we're going to take this point, and we're going to subtract this point from it, and it'll give us this length. 
So we have to do the same thing if we're choosing the, the height change. We have to take the height of this, h1, and subtract off the height of this, which is h, h0. So this is equal to delta h. Um, let's call it delta hr for right. right. So delta hr is equal to h1 minus h0 over delta x. You can do exactly the same for this point here. And so delta h left would be what? Uh, this head minus this head, which is h0 minus h3, again over delta x. And so we have two finite derivatives for each of those locations. And so they represent the kind of instantaneous gradients of head as you go from this little cell to this little cell here. So they give us, uh, I guess they are delta hrs over delta x might be one way to do it. And so that gives us at least these two values. But what we want is not just the magnitudes of how these change at two discrete locations. We want to know how the values of this gradient and this <coughs> gradient change as we go from upstream to downstream. So what this means is how quickly does this gradient change as you go from one location to the other. So we could write this, if you like, as the rate of change with location of delta h <coughs> over delta x. So this now is kind of just on the top. This is the, the parameters vary. And of course, we have two values of this. We have one that's downstream and one that's upstream. And so the amount that they change as you go from one to the other is just done by exactly what we did here. We did the magnitude downstream minus the magnitude upstream, downstream minus magnitude upstream, divided by the length over which it occurs. So in other case, if we did that for this, it would be what? So we take this one, it would be delta hr over delta x minus delta h left over delta x, all divided by delta x. And so if you write that out in longhand by substituting this, uh, we may run out of space, but it's going to look something like h1 minus h0 minus all of this term, maybe easy to bracket it, h0 minus h3 divided by, uh, there's a delta x here and there's a delta x here, and so this is just delta x all squared. So we've done nothing other than uh, do that, actually. That's exactly what this is. So we can take those two and we can write out the derivative exactly like that. Okay, oh, ran out of space. And so if we simplify that, then we can write this term. So if we go back to this expression here and resubstitute, then we have zero is equal to some constant k times this whole term. And this term is going to be equal to h1 minus h3, and these two terms cancel out. No, sorry, they don't cancel out, do they? h1 plus h3 minus 2h0. They don't cancel out. Um, divided by delta x all squared. And so if we take this value of delta x, which is just this spacing between each of these elements, to be the same always. Then we don't have to calculate this. It could be any number. We take this to be the same as well. We don't have to calculate that either. And so the solution to this equation is just got by taking the values of heads that are downstream of the point we're looking at, upstream of the point we're looking at, adding them together, and then subtracting off twice the magnitude of the inter intermediate one. And so what we could do is we could just write this as h0 is going to be equal to um, 
H1 minus H plus H3 divided by 2. Nothing more than that. And so it's actually really a very simple idea. Is that you take the place where you're sitting within the mesh. You look downstream to see what the head is. You look upstream to see what the head is. You add those values together. You divide by 2 and you replace the value here with that magnitude. Then you go to the next point, you sit here, you look upstream, downstream, you add those two values together, you divide by two, and you replace the value here, and you just work through the mesh sequentially. And so it's a very straightforward um, idea. If you were looking at, for instance, uh, the flow in the other direction, we didn't do flow in the, the y direction here, but if you did it in 3D, I guess I'm going to have to move to another place now. <coughs> So, so let's see. In, in so in, in in that's not two D. So in one D we have this. What are we? Six one. Isn't that perfect handwriting? Can you believe that? So in one D, so we have this little finite different star which is H0, H1, H3, and we have H0 is equal to H1 plus H3 over 2. If we do it in two dimensions, then this finite difference star looks like this. You can go through the same logic. I won't do it for you. But this is H1, H2, H3, H4, and H0. Then the value that you would put at this central node is going to be equal to just the sum of these uh, four. H1 plus the head at 2 plus the head at 3 plus the head at 4 divided by 4. And if you do it in 3D, you could probably guess I don't know. Yeah, I can draw this. I'm feeling artistic today. So you have this little finite difference star. So it's one, two, three, four, five, and six. And H0 at the middle. You can probably guess, right? H1 plus H2 plus H3 plus h4 plus h5 plus h6. Yeah. Um, is it over 6 or is it over 8? So, well, I'll leave it at 6 for now. So anyway, we'll work that out later. Um, yeah, over 6. It has to be over 6. And th that's it. And so what you could do is you could come back and you could try solving this uh, little problem that we have. It's probably worthwhile doing a very simple example just to kind of um, cement this idea. So what did we have? We had a, an aquifer that looked like this. We divided it up into, I think, two little, three little elements. And we defined those locations here. This is x. This is the upstream head. This is the downstream head. Uh, we said nothing about what it would be in between those, but we did say that if it was homogeneous, we'd expect it to be a linear distribution. Um, and let's try solving this problem just by tabulating it. So what we can do is we can write the head at the upstream location just as a table. So the head at node 1, the head at node 2, and the head at the downstream location. And so what we want to do is we want to figure out exactly what that is. So let's say the head upstream is equal to 1. Say the head downstream is equal to 0, which are your boundary conditions. And we have to make some choice. Well, let's not do the easy thing and just actually calculate what it should be. Let's assume that our first guess of where the, the hydraulic, uh, the water table, the hydraulic head should be is this. So that's our, our first guess. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through this. We're going to take this 
finite difference template, this star, and we're physically just going to take it and we're going to place it over this sequentially. First of all, we'll do it over these uh, three nodes here. And then once we've done that, we're going to do it over these three nodes here and calculate what the middle value is. And then we're going to repeat again and again until we get a solution that doesn't change anymore. And so the first thing is, so what do you say? We say we put it, first of all, uh, at this point here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the head here, add it to here, divide by 2, and replace it with this one. So these ones won't change as we go through this. These will always be um, ones and zeros because these are our boundary conditions. They don't change. So if we take it between these two points here, so we're going to take this value, this value, add them together, divide by 2, and place it here. So 1 plus 1 is 2, divided by 2 is 1. So then we're going to do this one here. Take this value, this value, add together, divide by 2. And so 1 plus 0 is 1, divided by 2 is half. Okay. And so now we have a choice. We could now do it for this one again, uh, for this one. Or we could do go back to the left-hand side and do it for this one. It doesn't really matter which one. Um, it, it might converge faster if we did it from the right, but it doesn't really matter. Let's go back to this one just to keep it simple. So this one. 1, so take the value here, add it to the value here. So it would be 1 plus a half, which is 3 over 2, divided by 2. So 3 over 2 divided by 2 <coughs> is 3 over 4, right? And now we do it for these two points here. Calculate this as a function of upstream and downstream. And so it's going to be 3 quarters plus 0 is 3 quarters divided by 2, which is going to be 3 over 8. So you get the idea. Go back to this point, add this and this together, and put it here. So it's be 1 and 3 eighths, which is... Um, 11 eighths, which is divided by 2, is 11 sixteenths. So now we're going to do it for this point here. So we take this value and this value, which is this and this. Whoops. So 0 plus 11 sixteenths is 11 sixteenths, divided by 2 is 11 thirty seconds, right? Go back to here. Again, this point as a function of this and this. So uh, 32 30 seconds plus 11 is 42 43 30 seconds. Uh, do it for this point. So we take this value and this value. So that's really easy, right? It now becomes 43 60 fourths. And it's getting to be kind of diminishing returns. What are these magnitudes? So 43 60 fourths, uh, what would be, so what do we think these are? We said before. So this goes down from 1 to uh, 0. So this should be 2 thirds. And this should be 1 third, right? And so 1 third would be what? What's a th how many threes in 64? So it's 20, 21 and a half, right? So that would be, well, wow, that's 43, double 21 and a half. So it's pretty close. That might be right on, right? And this would be double that. So we've basically reached a solution. So you keep on doing it as long as you wanted to, and nothing would change. So these would give you the values of the head. So now we know that these values are the magnitudes of the heads. So if you wanted to know, for instance, how quickly flow was coursing through here, so if you wanted to know what the velocity in the x direction was, say within this cell, velocity in x would be equal to, the Darcy velocity in x would be equal to minus hydraulic conductivity dh dx, which is going to be minus times the hydraulic conductivity. It's going to be head at point 
this one, equals h2 minus h1 over x2 minus x1. x2 is a downstream one, so this will be a positive delta x. So this is just going to be positive delta x, whatever the length is, divided by h2 minus h1. h2 is uh, smaller, so this will be minus one third. This is minus k. So in other words, this is going to be, if k is equal to 1 meter a second, then the Darcy velocity is going to be equal to minus times a minus, which is a plus, um, 1 over 3 times delta x. And if delta x is equal to 1, 1 meter, this is equal to a third of a meter a second for the Darcy velocity. If we know what the Darcy velocity is, we can get the advective velocity is equal to uh, the Darcy velocity divided by porosity. And if porosity is equal to 0 0.1, then uh, this is just going to be equal to 30, 30, right? Um, 10, 10 thirds. Is that right? I think, right? And so that's it. So we've got the distribution of heads within our system everywhere, which is useful. It's only useful because it allows us to calculate now within this element, we know that the velocity in the x direction is equal to this amount, either Darcy velocity or advective velocity. If we wanted to do the same in this element, then we just use uh, the different values of the heads. So this is for, if this, if this is element 1, and this is element 2, and this is element 3, then this is, these are the values for element 2, right? So we have that. And so that allows us to be able to say something about advective velocities. And so what we could now do is try and attack the um, the transport part. So everything that we've talked about here is for flow. And that doesn't say anything about how quickly stuff would be carried downstream. But a really very easy way to do that <coughs> would be by using uh, an idea that would allow us to represent transport with a very simple method which is called particle tracking. Oops. which does exactly as it sounds. The idea is that if you take, uh, if you have me standing in the middle of an aquifer here at some time, and uh, there's an x direction and a y direction, right-handed right coordinates always, and you want to see where I will be at some later time, then you can do that if you know my velocity. If you know the velocity I'm traveling with is Vx, I guess it would be an advective velocity, right? So um, let's see, what is it? Velocity is equal to change in location with time, by definition, which is equal to, um, for the same things we would do would be x1 minus x0 divided by t1 minus t0. So this is where I am at time t0. This is where I am at time, if you like, t1, t0. And you want to know exactly what this length is. Length is equal to x1 minus x0. So this is equal to basically length over t1 minus t0. 
So what we could do is just rearrange that. I guess I didn't really need to write these as separate components. Um, but you could rewrite that as the length you traveled is equal to the time it took to travel there times the velocity you're going at. And so in other words, if you know what this velocity is, which is 10 thirds of a meter per second, and if you know how long you have to be able to go there, say this is one second, then you know that in that time you travel 10 thirds of a meter, so 3.3 meters. And so what you could do is you could say that I'm putting a certain amount of material here at time t0. I know what the velocity of flow is that's getting carried downstream. So after one second, it'll be at this location here. After two seconds, I can do the calculation again, and it will be at some other location here. At three seconds, it will be some other location here. So this will be T2 and T3. And so particle tracking just does that. It puts a, a certain amount of mass in this kind of fictitious particle, and it allows that particle to get advected downstream. Once it gets downstream, then you can actually allow diffusion to occur and for it to kind of spread out a little bit and to change it. We won't really talk about that, but uh, you can actually look not only at advection, which is what we're dealing with here, but you can also look at uh, diffusion as well. And you're not just limited to uh, one dimensions, which this is. So this is just 1D, obviously. If you wanted to look at 2D, then the simple change from that would be what? You can just imagine it. Um, the length traveled in the x direction is going to be equal to the time of your time step multiplied by the advective velocity in the x direction. The length traveled in the y direction is just going to be the same time step multiplied by whatever the velocity is in the y direction. And likewise for 3D, by extension, it's just going to be length traveled in x, length traveled in y, length traveled in z, and it's just going to be the time step times the advective velocities in x, in y, and in z. So that's it. I mean, it really is. I mean, all these model, models are very complicated. And so this is kind of the, the entry level idea. But the, the basic concept is pretty straightforward, is you divide your system up into a whole series of, of blocks. These blocks are delimited in some way by nodes where you can write the magnitudes of your dependent variables. Your dependent variables are heads or concentrations. Let's, let's ignore concentrations for now. And if you kind of work your way through the grid, you can come up with a distribution of these heads which satisfies um, these differential equations. So all we've been attempting to do is to write an expression that basically satisfies these differential equations. And if you satisfy these differential equations uh, at every point, and also the boundary conditions, de facto, you have a solution, because it's satisfied everything you need to do. And so that's basically all numerical models do. They allow you to be able to, um, to solve for the values of some parameter. In this particular case, the parameter we're interested in is the distribution of head. If we have the value of head at every point, we immediately know how to get the value of velocity. <coughs> at every element between those points. If you know how to get the value of velocity, we have a way of tracking particles through our system to see what the path is that these things will take. And so it's really quite a straightforward um, approach to do that. Okay. And, and every model that you'd ever use, I mean, you, you probably will use it, pick it up and use it as a black box, and that's fine. Um, but that's basically what they do. And so um, very, very simple at some element, uh, elementary level. So that's kind of the background. So let's look at some examples. It's kind of a so these kinds of models have been around <laughs> since the mid 1970s, and this is actually an example from not very long after that. So they, like any kind of technology, they've reached their peak quite quickly, maybe in the first decade or 20 years, and no one really works on on modeling these kind of systems as a research topic anymore. But these are kind of standard 
consulting tools that people will use to solve problems. And anyone here is from New Jersey? This is an example from New Jersey. That, and so what I think is Atlantic City, actually. Um, and so what it is is just the kinds of steps that you go through to be able to solve um, a typical site characterization problem to be able to basically calibrate your model against the conditions which are present in this field below your feet uh, that you've done the site characterization from, and then extend it in the future to be able to see how different scenarios would work out if you try and remediate it in some way. So pretty standard way. So a model, you develop the model, you calibrate the model with the current conditions to make sure you can replicate some characteristic of it. And typically that characteristic of it would be the <laughs> distributions of heads that you have um, in piezometers that you have in your site. And then you exercise the model by pumping it maybe in this particular case to be able to see how quickly you get rid of the, the contaminants. So I think what it was was a, a landfill somewhere near Atlantic City, close to which the well field for Atlantic City was exist, was present. And so all the things that were leaching out of this landfill were happily finding their way down gradient um, towards this uh, well field. And so the question is, what do you do about that? to be able to stop it happening. could remove the landfill, but if, of course, you've got things in there which are already in progress, that doesn't necessarily help you because this stuff is still traveling downstream. So you could use the techniques that the people were talking about, active uh, pumping methods last time to be able to create this uh, zone by which you capture the components that are going down from this in a plume. So the plume is coming out of this. So you put a well in here. And you suck water out of the well, and you hope that by doing that, you pull the plume in and capture everything that's in here, so you actually remediate it. So that's the kind of uh, solution to this. I guess I don't need to get rid of that. But that's basically the idea. So all of these different features on here, these dots are different wells uh, that have been placed in to do the site investigation, for which there's information. This is the pumping well field. These are the uh, lines of a couple of different cross-sections across here. These are roads. I think the scale says 1,000 feet, so you get some kind of idea of scale in this. And so the idea is um, for finite difference models, we talked about a finite difference model which would work by taking a grid that would look like this. So our grid would basically cover it. So our grid would be something that would look like this. And we define the behavior at a variety of different points. So our finite difference star, for instance, might be these four points that we'd have surrounding this central one here. This happens to be just a different method called a finite element method. It doesn't really matter. But the basic idea is that you divide it into a whole bunch of nodes. These nodes have some cells that are present between them. And these cells have some hydraulic conductivities or permeabilities assigned to them. Um, if, for instance, the permeability changes as you go from one location here to another location here, then you might just populate these cells with the appropriate magnitudes of hydraulic conductivity, which represent that particular region. Nothing more than that. You apply boundary co conditions to it. So in our one-dimensional model, we had an upstream and a downstream boundary condition. So we define behaviors upstream and downstream. So the boundary conditions would be what we'd apply to these boundary nodes, all of them around the periphery. And then we try and solve for the interior nodes and try and match them with the values that we have at the, these particular uh, piezometer locations. And so what we might do is we might choose to have our nodes so that they actually co-locate the places where these wells or piezometers are in the field so that we can directly compare the value of the head that we get at this location with the head that we have in the particular piezometer. Okay? So you cover the, 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 um, the area where you have with some kind of mesh. Um, you use that mesh with the places where you have magnitudes of hydraulic conductivities measured in piezometers. I can't see exactly where all of these are. Uh, with these values of the piezometers, I think I let you off doing the question, the part two question for uh, flow down gradient from some spill site where you had some hydraulic uh, head magnitudes at a variety of different locations. 
What you could do with those, of course, is you could contour them relative to each other, right? If you contour them where those contours actually go through and honor the values of the heads that you have in those piezometers, then you have a contour field. If you have a contour field that you then draw a cross-section across, then you can compare the magnitudes of the heads that you have along that cross-section with the values you'd have on your model along that cross-section. And that's exactly what was done here. If you look at the heads as you go downstream from some upstream location to some downstream location, and you compare the values you have for, these are just different measured heads at different times, all these different contours, and one of them is the simulation. I think the red one here is a simulation. You'd like that value to be able to match roughly the values you have for those measured heads in situ. If you match them with some fidelity, then you have some confidence in your model that your model is actually representing reality rather than just being some kind of uh, garbage in, garbage out type, uh, type model you've used. So if you can calibrate your uh, head, mo head magnitudes against your model, then you think it might represent something. So then you can go ahead and do something. And so what you could do is you could let these um, groundwater extraction wells pump out at whatever rate they pump and then look at how the uh, water contours, uh, you know, you're, you're pumping into this, so you get this kind of cone of drawdown occurring, both from downstream of these wells and upstream of these wells. And so you get a flow regime that would be set up as a function of this. So this would give you now your revised flow system. So if you kind of anchor that with what we did here, was we figured out exactly what the flow system in this was first, and that allowed us as a function of the known distributions of heads at all our nodes, which are now in this kind of two-dimensional plan view. We have all the heads. So we should be able to calculate our velocities at any point. If we know what our velocities at any point are, we should be able to see if we kind of release some contaminants exactly where they go to as a function of time. And so this uses a different method from this kind of particle tracking, but the end result's the same, is if you have now, with your flow conditions, you could calculate everywhere in your model, every single one of these elements, you could calculate what the velocities are. And they'll be different in every single one of these elements. If you know what those are, you can run a model that represents transport, and so that the source region that you start with, which is the landfill, which I guess was this kind of prismatic region here, after 10 years or so, uh, has the lowest concentrations downstream, the highest concentrations are close to the, uh, the source, and you know what the concentrations are everywhere, <sighs> just as a function of pumping from here and sucking this stuff downstream into this well. And then so what you can also do now is do something to counter that. And so going back then to the contour map of heads, what happens if you put in a, an interceptor wells? So you pump out of each of these at some rate. The stuff that's trying to get past here now gets sucked here instead of happily going down here. It tries to go here. And you try and capture it by pumping out of these fast enough to be able to, to capture it. And so you pump from this and this. You can see what the, the flow contours will, or the flow lines would be as a result of this, goes from high to low. And so this would be kind of the flow pattern that you'd set up around this. These would be the local flow velocities that you'd have in any of the um, local elements. And as a result of that, after 10 years, instead of your plume looking like this, uh, with relatively close together contours representing high concentrations and gradients, after 10 years, it looks like this. And after 25 years, it looks like this. And of course, the important thing is that this front, which had gone here after 10 years, I guess you could surmise that after 20 years, it'd be down here somewhere if this wasn't here. And so certainly, it's intercepted the, the well supply. And so by putting in these interceptor wells, you've headed it off. You've stopped it from getting here after 10 years. And certainly, you've stopped it from getting here after 25 years because you're basically recovering the, uh, the components from this initial source here. And of course, this source is actually a, a, 
a source that's disappeared after some time. If the source hadn't been removed, it would still, I guess you'd think that the plume would probably look like this, right? There would still be a source region here that would be emanating and it would be going down, down gradient. And that's probably it, yeah, after 20, 25 years. So that's basically the idea. So the idea is to be able to make a model, uh, to be able to calibrate it against some observations you have in situ, to be able to uh, run it uh, in forward model to test some different scenarios. And so I suppose the design features that would come out of this is you'd know where these wells could go uh, that would be adequate to catch it. And I suppose you'd also know some kind of pumping rates, which would also be adequate to pump this. Uh, too small, and everything would zoom straight past. Too, um, too large, and you'd dewater your aquifer, but you'd also be treating more water than you needed to. And so you could basically optimize the design for that. So it's something you might want to use for your projects, conceivably, if, if uh, uh, you're using this kind of technique. Um, and certainly it's something that you'll end up using for assignment four, which is basically doing the cleanup for Smithville.